Okay, so group number one. Service charges that were showing up on their accounts, and they, they just 
didn't understand why because they were being lied to by the employees. And so they ended up leaving the bank for another bank. And also the employees of the bank were pushed every single day by their supervisors to do whatever it takes to make the sale. And so that led to things to like lying to the customers straight to their face about what they needed or what they should do. And also forging signatures to create these fake bank accounts for their customers. And then, so once this was made public, um, Wells Fargo had to apologize publicly to everyone and they ended up firing around 5,300 employees because of this and also had to pay around $185 million in fines. So we've heard from commercial side or from banking side, so we figured we'd touch on uh, the political side as well. I'm not sure if you guys are aware, we did have an election recently. Uh, whether you feel one way or another about either candidate, we're going to try to stick very high bipartisan here. So we focused on three things from each candidate that we found to be overly unethical as far as what they were displaying or saying or doing. We'll go with Donald Trump first. Uh, the Hispanics and the wall he wants to build. This country was founded on ideas of immigration, trying to kick people and keep people from immigrating, whether it's legally or illegally, kind of unethical based on how we've displayed this country to be for the past 240 years. We've always had issues with immigration, whether it be the Irish, whether it be the Chinese, we, but never to this extent, okay? Uh, sexual assault accusations, which was fairly recent, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, we've had a few presidential, or a few presidents that have had some issues with this in the past, but nothing before they were president, nothing came out prior to their election that could have, should have kept them from the nomination or the presidency itself. And then the not willing to abdicate, not willing to accept, or not willing to vocalize that he would accept if he had lost. The, the nomination, or sorry, the, the election. And that is very dangerous. One of the things America prides itself on is that our peaceful transition of power. Right? We can go from one president to the next president without a coup or without mass hysteria. Him not willing to say that and actually vocally calling it rigged before the, even before the election even started, it, it cast a lot of doubt and in some aspects, shame onto the election process itself. Now, as far as Hillary Clinton, obviously a very long list of things there as well. Her issues in Benghazi, whether you believe or not that she received the over 600 messages and requests for uh, more security or concerns that they had, uh, she declares that she did not receive them. There has been no viable proof that she had received them. <laughs> there are still issues. The fact that she, it was her job to know, right? I think we can all agree on that. The fact that she didn't, that leads to unethical decision. The fact that she's not great at standing up in front of the bullet. She wants to dodge it and hide from it. Unethical in my mind, just taking responsibility for your actions is one of the best things a person can do, whether they're good or bad. Private email server with deleted emails, once again, same issue. Set up a private email server in her residence, so that way it's ease of use. Same thing with the cell phone, sending potentially classified emails via her cell phone. And then having deleted emails. Had she not done that part, everything would have been fine. Right? She could have stayed up and said, listen, I went for the easy route, I apologize. She didn't even do that. Never, never took the bullet once again. Right? Unethical decisions by trying to be shady, trying to outrun the scandal rather than just facing it head on. Which is one thing Donald Trump has been incredibly great at. Every time something comes up, he gets it face on. Whether it's landing on his face or going through it, every time he attacks it straight on. Clinton Foundation quid pro quo. That's one of the big issues. I'm not sure if you're aware of what the Clinton Foundation is. It's a massive charitable organization that takes money and gives it to charities around the world. One of the biggest issues they would have been facing had Clinton won the election 
would have been a potential quid pro quo arrangement of whether it be corporate America, whether it be other politicians, whether it be outside uh, international influences donating to their campaign for rep reciprocity later. Okay? There was a big issue with that, and a lot of articles written on that as well. But once again, whether you believe in either candidate or neither candidate or both candidates equally, public office is one of the single most areas that responsibility, that truthfulness, that worthiness should be you know, accounted into, right? The fact that neither of these candidates, or both of these candidates, had issues, to say the least, with those you know, unethical behaviors or decisions, it was a dangerous picture. Hopefully it turned out well. Hopefully in the next, throughout these next four years, we'll be able to you know, look back and say that everything turned out fine, that we were better than we were. Time will tell that. Um, with bankers, advisors, and corrupt politicians at every corner, it's, um, there's plenty of uh, unethical marketing going around in my society. Uh, it is important that we try to practice a skeptical approach to this, and not succumb to the fear that's being peddled towards us, especially with the recent elections, there's a lot of fear, fearful rhetoric going around, and it's important to not take everything at face value. Um, at the same time, we must keep in mind that oftentimes unethical, unethical behavior is the act of the minority. Um, typically, it's not the general public going around doing this. It's the act of individuals. And despite what the media says, the world is not out to get you. During these times, it's important to Remember Theodore Roosevelt's words: "In any moment of decision, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The worst thing you can do is nothing." That would be it. Do you have any questions or concerns or any topics you want to bring up? Like you talk about Pepsi and the juice market and the words all natural and GMO. I mean, what does that mean, do you think? What does all natural mean? Uh, I mean, based on what I would say that the consumer expects is something that isn't uh, modified in any way or just something. I mean, because I don't really know. Uh, how do you, well, how do you they, define genetically modified? That's the point. And nowadays, another one of the concerns that we were finding in this article is that should those even be monikers anymore anyway? Because it's kind of hard to define all natural. There are very few things that don't have some kind of genetic modification in them, even if it was not added later. Mm -hmm. Seeds have been manipulated so many times that you can almost not find a pure corn seed or wheat seed anymore. Right. So, that's another part of the, the topic. We decided to leave it out on this one just because of the other topics we could talk about. Because we figured somebody would ask a question on it. But um, that, that's <laughs> So if, if you think, I mean, would you consider a banana, for example, to be natural? Depends on where it came from. The, the, the bananas the that we have banana, yeah. today are, are probably going to die, by the way, in the next 10 years. There's a disease out there that's killing banana plants. And the bananas that we have today are not the bananas that my mother grew up with as a child. They, the bananas that she grew up with as a child were killed by another disease that wiped out all of the bananas that were in existence then. And this is a hybridized form of, uh, of, of, a, of a banana. So they to strain this to try and deal with the other um, problem. They created a banana that was resistant to that type of disease. Now, the current banana's got another disease that's going to kill them all out. And question is whether or not we'll even have bananas in 10 years or whether they'll find another hybridization that will allow us to continue to enjoy bananas. But I think lots of people would say bananas are an all-natural product, but technically speaking, they're a genetically modified product, right? And they've been modified from what they once were. And as a point, we're not taking the stand that GMOs are bad either. Yeah, we're taking the stand that it, you know. It's basically just what the consumer is saying, what they expect from a product. It's not, it's not really what we're, like, our definition of GMOs. Yeah, we're not saying that, you know, 
we just want to, if they're saying that it's no GMOs or it is all natural, that it is indeed as natural as it can be, or that it says no GMOs, that it doesn't have, that it's not a GMO. That's what the false advertising, the unethical decision making in that kind of advertising. Okay. All right. Good job. Good job. Once again. Obviously, you want to arrange all the data so that it makes sense. If I told you three million people bought an iPhone, didn't tell you what kind of iPhone, didn't tell you what they paid, where they bought it, that's useless information. If you don't clean it up and make it important and organize it so you can understand it, it's not going to do you much good for analysis purposes. Um, one of the important things about cleaning it up also, making sure the data is all you know helpful, is a lot of times you'll get duplicate data or errors in the data. And that's why you want to go through and clean it up. And that's also why you get things like surveys, because in order for them to understand some of the data they've received, they have to actually go and ask you questions about it. Otherwise, it's useless information to them, and they can't uh, uh, use it to make any real good, I, or good decisions business-wise. Um, and everyone is going to be trying to use this data to see what you guys want, what you want to buy, how to help you. And, um, sorry, I'm trying not to change topic. And then you go into data analysis. And that's where you actually go through and try and understand what the data is telling you. First, you make sure it all helps you by, you know, cleaning up and organizing it. Then you go and see what it actually tells you. And there are a lot of things that you have to be aware of when you're going through and analyzing it so you don't make errors, such as making sure that you're getting facts and not opinions. Facts are going to be more helpful because no one can argue with a fact, theoretically. And you also want to make sure that 
you're not getting any kind of cognitive bias that would, you know, so you interpret it incorrectly. And furthermore, you don't want people to present the data in, a, in an incorrect way because you can use numbers to tell people anything you want if you know what you're doing. And obviously, that's, if you're trying to use your numbers to mislead your customers, that's going to cause problems. Um, sorry, go ahead and really quick. Um, yes. Um, the things they most often use the data analytics for um, in companies are things like cost reduction, because with all the data, they know where not to put their money if they're careful and usable. Um, and it helps them with faster, better decisions because they have a lot of data and they can use it to help you. And then they use it for new products and services because if you're telling them what you want by buying certain things, they can predict what they will need in the future. Uh, um, you And the biggest people who are going to use the data um, and this kind of thing I mean, all companies that are pretty big are going to try and use some kind of data analytics for the big data. But the biggest ones who use most of the data are places like travel and hospitality. That helps them know what, what kind of services to give and how to provide them. Um, healthcare, you know, if they can predict how, when and how you're going to be sick based on things you're doing, theoretically. That, that's more of a future thing, obviously. We're not quite there yet. But that is one of the theoretical possibilities. The government can uh, see how to help their taxpayers. They can also theoretically, if they gather enough data, predict when people might commit crimes and do a better job of preventing them. And then uh, obviously retail. People are trying to sell you things. And the more information they have about you, the more likely they are to successfully make a sale when they advertise it. <coughs> All right, the two largest companies that partake in big data collection, when you guys think of like ads popping up everywhere, which companies do you usually think of? Facebook? Facebook. Google. Google? <laughs> All right, well, yes, Facebook being <laughs> one, definitely, uh, and Google. So, <laughs> maybe what's that you guys said? <laughs> Bonus points to you guys. Facebook, actually, if you guys did not know or you're just not aware, they can track basically everything that you do. As long as you have that app on your phone, Messenger as well, they're constantly tracking you. You don't even have to have you don't even have to have the app open. It's still going. Google, basically the same thing. I mean, I don't know how many times I give my card and it tells me where I'm going. That happens to all of us, right? Where you're going, how long it's gonna take you to get there. We really don't think of that as tracking, but that's basically what it's doing. That's Google Maps or regular maps if you're on iPhone. It's basically still tracking you. Down to the searches, anything that you search, recently view, it's keeping up with you. And they're using those ads to basically benefit. It's important to know how much information they're getting about us that we don't even know or recognize that we're giving up, we don't really have to give consent to them. They, they're tracking every website we visit, every Facebook video we view. They know what we're doing, and it's really important to realize that. And the other thing is, you typically do have to give them most of that data in the terms and conditions. Even if you didn't look at them, that doesn't mean they can't use that. Nobody reads. Which no one reads that, but I just recently found out Jared actually does read them. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that out. There. That's because there was a video game one time that literally took people's souls. It was in the contract. They gave them back, but. <laughs> uh, we have other video playing to give an example of how some of these big companies collect data from the consumers and let them use it for monthly purposes. And in this case, it's Target, and the video is pretty much self explanatory.
Sorry, guys. She bought a large amount of lotion, and that's a common indicator that you're in your second trimester. And that's why, and they've made a group of products that, if purchased all together, they do tend to point out whether a person is pregnant with fairly high accuracy. And in, in an article I read about this, um, that you are using that say, the guy that is the one that analyzes all the statistics and stuff, he says they're actually able to pretty accurately guess when the baby's going to be born. Like in a really active, in a really small window, they know when the baby's going to be born even though the woman hasn't given target that information. So it's really scary what stuff they can know about us. And that's the thing, she didn't give it directly, but she did based on her purchasing. What you do <coughs> online and what you buy can affect what people know about you. All right, legal restrictions. So obviously a lot of things, there's legal restrictions, what you can, what you can connect and not connect the data, such like the FERPA, Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, prohibits companies from using data found on students' official education records, such as date of birth, grades, test scores, discipline records, anything like that. But schools that use a cloud search provider for emails are not protected by the FERPA. That means that information that contains in those emails, they have a right to, those emails have a right to um, about this, most a lot of parents don't know that some school districts actually sell the information that they have on their students to companies that use it for big data collection and advertising purposes. And that's what this is about. The FERPA Act it protects some stuff, but say if they have a cloud service provider for their emails, if someone's sending something about a bike then advertisements will be able to see, oh, they're interested in bikes, and they'll be able to advertise bikes to them. And also, about that, it's important to know, other countries do have stricter regulations about what advertisers can and can't do. For example, in Argentina, companies have to tell a person why they're collecting the data and who will receive it. And then in several European countries, consumers are actually allowed to go through their data profile and change information or remove information and um, recently, the, uh, the FCC, which is the Federal Communi Communications Commission, they tried to, pa to pass regulations on what information can be collected and what can be done with it. But um, Steve Posiask, he wrote in Forbes, um, this is a direct quote, no one can deny that consumers should have the power to protect their data while they surf the web, but these rules fail to supply that power. 
and worse, they only apply it to part of the internet while leaving the internet's biggest privacy offenders, companies like Facebook and Google in the Wild West, free to take consumers' data and use it as they please. So even though the FCC is passing regulations that should theoretically help consumers, Facebook, Google, they're still able to do what they're doing, get our information, and things like that. So um, regarding this, there should theoretically be benefits that come with big data collection. And there are. It's not as scary as it seems. You get, you're able to access deals and stuff that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Um, you know, you get a special coupon. And the advertisements you see on Facebook, usually you're not seeing stuff you don't care about. So that's kind of, it's, I'd rather see an advertisement that I'm interested in than something that I could care less about. And um, most importantly, Facebook and Google get billions of dollars off of advertisements because they're able to target them so well. So I don't think people would be willing to pay for those services. And because the advertisements, Facebook and Google are able to remain free for us. So I think there should be a, obviously there, there's good stuff that comes with advertisements and things of that nature with the information they get about us. But there should clearly be stricter guidelines as to what can be found about us and things that we can prevent companies from doing with our information. And hopefully that's in the not so distant future. And if you want to protect your data, you can use things like ad blockers and uh, things that prevent site analytics. That's one of the ways to protect yourself. Um, so um, if you're really scared about this, you can completely stop using the internet. And you, can, <laughs> you can cut your credit debit cards. Just Go use cash. Woods somewhere. Just use cash for the transaction if you're really scared about this. It's not as scary as it seems, but there really should be circuit regulation on it. So, any questions, concerns? Yeah. So I do have a, a question. Personally, what do you guys think that of the stuff that they do legally uh, collect that they shouldn't be allowed to? You mentioned stuff like you know buying patterns so they can you know, reinforce advertising, give you discounts on stuff you're already buying or shouldn't be. Yeah. Actually, would be buying as well. Well, I don't know if it's so much as what they can't collect, but it's more like the assumptions that they should they can make about us, like that pregnancy thing, that's really scary, so, you know, I think they should maybe not be able to make assumptions off of that, um, probably not have access to our emails like the school district had, um, basically anything that we want to keep private, and it's more just like a personal thing, so like I said, in the European countries, they're able to change what, what they're being collected, what data is being collected on them, so it should, it's more of like a person by person basis we should have. And also, uh, I just remembered this about the Target thing. In order to avoid that kind of thing happening in the future, what Target started doing was hiding advertisements for things like baby formula, among other, other inane advertisements like lawnmowers or something. And so that way they don't specifically advertise you, but they still specifically advertise you. You're not so scared when all you see is baby products. You see, oh, there's one baby product that I, that I use in a lawnmower, so you don't get suspicious of yeah. what they know about you. Which is, and that's kind of one of the things about what they're collecting that makes it kind of shady because they're trying to hide that they're doing it from you a little bit. Hide it in the terms and conditions. Make sure you don't or suspect that they're advertising directly to you by hiding it among other things. Okay. So what do you think the consumer can do if they're having issues with this, this going on, big data collection? Even though they've already agreed to Facebook, say they're on Facebook, they already accepted the agreed to get on the terms of it, aren't they legally held saying, oh, well, you agreed to these terms, then yeah. Yeah. You know, we can't do anything about it? Yeah, and like I said, um, <coughs> the user can always, if, they, if they're really that worried about it, they can always not use Facebook, they can delete it. But, I mean, if you're, like I said, if you're extremely worried, you can delete it, but it's not something that, is too terrifying just yet, but it definitely can be in the future. It can get worse if something's not done about it. And there are actually software programs out there that you can download to prevent like, people getting data together. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's what I was talking about a minute ago with the the things that blight that block site analytics. Yeah, but even if you get that, you still get tracked with your credit card and stuff like that. So there's still there's still ways for companies to do it. No yeah, it kind of depends on what you're doing on the internet. If you're just going out and browsing and they can't get the site analytics from that. But if you're going to buy something, they're still going to get something from it. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I don't 
Um, what do you think, which ethical theory do you think supports the use of the gap? So you have three you know, that, are, that are basically valid ethical theories. You have duty ethics, um, utilitarian, which is the greatest happiness principle, and then you have uh, virtue ethics. Which one do you think supports the use of the gap? I, first, I mean, we might all have different answers. But personally, I think utilitarian, just because they're more the most most people benefit from it because people are able to save money, costs are kept down, the advertising is well, they pay more for advertising, but they're more specific, so they they tend to be more successful. So that helps the companies. And then, like I said, if if some shady stuff does happen, <coughs> it's not as scary as it could be. So I think most people benefit from it. And, yeah. yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I think it's a it's a cost benefit analysis and most of us most of us think that we give up a lot of our privacy, I think, on Facebook because it helps us stay connected to people that we might not otherwise be connected to. It's it does it, it provides, you know, I, I went to Florida with the ICSC and I was able to, you know, post things, you know, pictures yeah. and things like that. Yeah, it's it's important to realize that there should be a, a balance for what you're giving up and what you're getting in return and Right now, it seems like the companies kind of have it more going for them as far as what we're giving up, but we're still getting benefits in return from it. So. And the other thing that a lot of people are worried about is not specifically the companies, it's people who hack the companies and take that information and then use it for nefarious purposes. Yeah. All right. Yes, think about this. Um, I like that you incorporated the video, even though we didn't use it. I will try and get the, the videos to work. I'll uh, make sure that the, the sound comes on. I don't know what, I mean, I've tried everything, so I apologize for that, but that's a good job that you all did that. The other thing that I like that you did is you tried to get some audience participation by asking a question. I think that's a really good, good job. So, good deal. Thank you very much. So, on Tuesday, we'll do groups two and four who have problems, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll charge ahead. I don't know that we'll get all the way to group number five okay. on Tuesday, but I've got a little bit of breathing room in there, and so we may spill over um, even into the next uh, week. So, all right. Um, I forgot to pass the roll sheet today because I'm in pain, and so, yes, sir. Uh, pro I, yeah, probably. Are you group number five? Yeah. I was my are you from number five? Okay. What?